Hi, my name is Aisha T. Momo. I am going to be telling my story of growing up without both my parents in my life and also experiencing sexual abuse, as well as my FGM story. I'm originally from Sierra Leone and Guinea. My auntie said that we had to move to Sierra Leone and that was the last time that I saw my mum because unfortunately when we moved, she stayed back in Guinea whilst everyone else moved to Sierra Leone. When I was about seven or so, I was taken to have FGM done. In Sierra Leone, we refer to FGM as bundle. I just knew that this was a practice that some people experienced. Most of the things that my grandma was saying was that, oh, we're gonna take you to your grandma's village. We're gonna see where she's from. We're just going to visit. And I just remember just standing there and just putting my hand and just touching my private part and just thinking, oh my gosh, this is the last time I'm gonna have this here. But of course, I didn't really have a choice as to whether or not I took part in that or not before everything gets started that we have to go to get our hair done. And there was loads of us. I believe that there was about probably 15 or so girls and I was the youngest because I was only about seven or so whereas everyone else was at least 15 and I just remember um, masquerades coming into the, um, the hairdressers so if you don't know what masquerades are if you watch a lot of the African movies people that wear the costumes the costumes were really scary for me I was screaming and crying, hiding, trying to run. We did start in the early morning hours and it took place the whole day. There was two rooms, all the girls were in one room. One of the older ladies will come, knock on the door, call your name and tell you to come out. When you come out, you go and they do whatever they have to do to you. You would then be separated into a separate room. And so I remember just kind of feeling so fearful as the countdown was coming. So they started with the oldest and they ended with the youngest. We're not allowed to go outside. We're not really allowed to speak. We're meant to be quiet. You know, everybody's just preparing for their moment to be called up. Yeah, I just remember going outside with this woman. They took me to the side of the house. And when I got there, I think there was about four or five women. One of them was my grandma. And so literally they told me to lay down and basically I was laying out on the ground on the hard concrete floor. There was nothing there. I wasn't laying on any class or anything like that. One of the ladies held um, this arm, the other one held this arm, and then the other one held um, my leg. So one person was holding like my right leg, another person was holding my other leg. And then we had the actual lady who was doing the cutting and I believe she cut it with a blade. So literally as I'm screaming and like, trying to like not move and stuff. Obviously they're holding me and you just sit there and the lady literally got the blade and just cuts me, just cuts me. I'm feeling the pain, I'm feeling everything. And then it's just, I just remember standing up and just seeing my blood that was just streaming down. Um, so I believe from there, I got stitched up or no, I can't remember whatever happened, but I just remember that just being held and being cut. So after that, you get given something to wear. It's like a bad bone or form of like a bandage. So you wear that, you know, and then you get sent to the other room. The instruction was once you're in the other room, you wait there for a little while. We basically got taken to another place. So we had to travel to another area, which was kind of like a river. And all of us were naked. We get placed to the river and the women would like take water and like say some stuff and then like wash us. The whole point of that was that we were being cleansed and that were being cleaned and stuff like that. Everybody went through the process. We went back to the house. And I just remember um, someone saying to me that one of my aunties had just arrived from Freetown. So I just remember being like, so excited to go and see her. I just left the room, I ran, and when I went to hug her, my pampers, everything fell off. So everybody was just kind of shouting and saying, oh my gosh, like cover up, cover up. So she covered me very quickly and took me back to the room. And I was told that I'm not allowed to come out. We had um, a special ceremony where we got dresses made for us. We got, you know, everyone was looking nice. Everybody got to choose the color of the African cloth that they wanted to wear. And then after that, um, I think we probably stayed for a few days and then we traveled back to Sierra Leone. It just kind of seemed normal because everybody in the house that was female, you know, had gone through the same process. It was just this idea that this is something that you go through culturally. This is something that my grandma really, really believed in. And I think that my aunties as well, all of them had gone through the same thing. I don't know what ended up happening, but I think we just ended up not having much money anymore, not having as much as we did before. And so we had to move from the house that was staying at to another house. That's where the dynamic of things kind of changed a bit more because 
the house that we're at, there was more people. The neighbors' kids would come, so it was much more friendly in the sense of there was loads more people that were my age. So we moved to another area, and this house was a lot more quieter than the house before. So I was now the youngest person in the house. I wasn't allowed to go outside to play with the kids, so I'll just be in the veranda just looking down I'm at the kids playing. So I think when my sister traveled that's when everything just kind of went a bit left for me because I remember that during the night time as I would be sleeping I don't know if I was about eight years old nine years old or around that time I had a family member that basically came into my room at night and began having sex with me so the first time it happened I thought it was a dream but I remember it happened again a second time and this time around I actually realized that this is happening and that was something that was very difficult um for me because number one I didn't have anyone to speak to about what was happening. And number two, even if I were to speak to somebody, I had this fear that nobody was going to believe me. My aunt that is staying in the house, she doesn't know anything that is happening. And I just had nobody that I was close to. That was the moment that I really started grieving and crying a lot more when it came to my parents. So somewhere down the line, I was in that same room again, having a nap. Um, and someone else came in the room during that time and started penetrating me once again. And that was actually another family member who was older than me. Why would you do that? Because I haven't, I didn't do anything. I literally came into this room to sleep. Once again, just kind of seemed like, all these people are older than me. I'm young. I feel like they're just doing this. If I speak up, no one's going to believe me. I'm probably gonna get in trouble or I'm probably gonna get beaten. But I just remember this kind of feeling really lonely as a child i think at this point i'm now like 10 or so my auntie comes to me and she tells me i'm going to be traveling to the uk just to see my sister that's gone there already so i'm really excited i'm really happy it's a new city it's a new country and she introduces me to a friend of hers who was nigerian this friend basically ends up being the person that I stay with her and my sister kept trying to enroll me in school. I remember having struggles with that, but they ended up somewhere or another, you know, enrolling me into primary school, um, year six in the UK, which is like the last year before you move on to secondary school. And they didn't really know anything about my background. They didn't know anything about my past. You know, I was just this new student that had joined. My sister at the time, she had to move somewhere else. I couldn't stay with her. And so I had to move to stay with one of my family members who was a male. He was staying in a one bedroom flat and he lived about 45 minutes to an hour away from my school. And so unfortunately I started going to school late. I get taken out of my lesson and I'm invited into a meeting. In this meeting, I'm then introduced to somebody called a social worker. So they're asking me questions about my life. I'm telling them. And then on Friday, I'm home by myself. I hear a knock on the door, I see that it's the social worker that I had spoken to at school, you know, and she tells me to open the door. I opened the door and she told me that she had come to my house on something called an unexpected visit. She said that this is a visit that is done that you're not made aware that it will be taking place. And so she looked around my house, went upstairs in the room, saw that it was really messy. I had dirty clothes everywhere. And she literally told me, pack your stuff we're going to be taking you to live with someone else. I got in the car, they drove me 45 to an hour away to um, another person's house. I get out of the car, I'm introduced to this lady. We sit down in the sitting room. They take me upstairs to a room and literally the lady tells me that this is going to be your room. This is where you're going to be staying. That was my transition into foster care. I went through a lot in that time, experiencing that traumatic event. Everything just came crashing down on me. I just felt like once again, all the pain and hurt and rejection and everything that I'd gone through, just felt like I just couldn't take it anymore. My suicidal thoughts became worse. I was crying every day to school on my journey and just feeling like giving up on life. I didn't have my parents in my life. I've gone through so much rejection, so much struggle by myself. You know, don't have any relationship with my family. You don't even know where 
to my family members where, you know, I remember coming across a scripture that said, although my father, my mother forsake me, it says that the Lord receives me. I just remember reading that scripture and just thinking to myself, the scriptures has something in there that speaks directly to me because in that moment, I felt forsaken by everybody, by my family, especially my parents. But I just felt like this just gave me some kind of reassurance that there is hope. And so I think that started a new work in me. I saw a change in my behavior. I needed something that was going to give me hope. I'm currently 24 years old. I graduated from university. I studied social anthropology. Um, I graduated with a 2-1 in anthropology um, and I got a first class overall in anthropology. So I currently work in government here in the UK. It's been an interesting experience. I also spend a lot of my time um, speaking, encouraging young people, um, doing motivational talks and events and stuff like that. I actually started them at university um, just as a way of, you know, encouraging others um, that have gone through the things I've gone through. And then in 2022, um, I wrote my first book titled The Power of Perseverance and Resilience, Navigating Foster Care, Abuse and Abandonment. And I kind of wrote this book in 2022 because when I graduated from university in 2021, I found myself being homeless. And so once again, in that space of being homeless, I'm looking for that thing that's going to get me out of this state of depression. And I had to remind myself that I haven't come this far to give up. I've done so well without my parents and my family in my life. And so I decided that I was gonna write this book just in memory even of my mom, you know, in memory of my dad, to remind myself that all hope is not lost and that my story matters, my voice matters. And I believe that um, all, writing this book has really caused me to see that, you know, I am important and that there are people that need to hear what I've gone through. And so, yeah, now working um, in government, I'm also having the opportunity to not only bring change um, to care leavers and people that have grown up in foster care, but actually working, um, you know, to serve the wider public. And hopefully in the next couple of years, I'll be getting more involved um, in projects to do with um, FGM and violence, and violence against women and girls. And I think another thing that I'm also doing is that I try to use my pain of not having my parents there to give hope to others. And so I've actually, I raised a GoFundMe campaign last year where I traveled, well, I traveled this year to Ghana. I donated money to care leavers who are people that have grown up in foster care. And I also donated money to an orphanage I, I had a fun day for the kids, had a big party for the kids, gave back, donated clothes, books, and all of that stuff, you know? So that was really great. And I've also currently just started a new project, which is raising funds for survivors of FGM and also orphans in Mali. And the reason why all these things are so important for me is that only after I've looked introspectively and started my healing journey, that's how I've now been able to and um, try to offer this help and support. And me doing this GoFundMe, for example, for FGM survivors, it's not just for them. I'm doing it for myself because I'm finding a, re a reason to keep, to keep living. And so I've actually found that doing stuff and being committed to things is one of the strengths that I have. And the more I'm dedicated and committed to helping other people, I believe that, you know, the more I'm able to, to be that strong person that uh, God has created me to be. In a village called Kono, so it's spelled K-O-N-O -O in Sierra Leone, it's, it's still a, a cultural practice that still goes on. FGM is very harmful. Of course, there's a range of different reasons why cultures, certain cultures or countries practice FGM. I did a lot of reading, extensive reading on this during my time at university studying social anthropology, read about FGM and different cultural practices. What I would say is that one of the things that a lot of, that comes up a lot is that FGM was considered to be a rite of passage. FGM is supposed to be something that women go through that is a sign that they're now matured or a sign that they're ready for marriage and womanhood and all of that stuff. But I think another thing that um that uh, another idea around FGM is that um, it's a kind of cleansing that stops women or girls from being promiscuous. And I think the irony of it all is that as I've now grown up a little bit and I've entered into my early 20s, I'm realizing that not only has FGM caused me to be ashamed, um, it's also affected my self-esteem. And it's interestingly led me to a place of 
not being promiscuous, but really being at a place where I, I'm intrigued and curious to know more about sex. I'm intrigued and curious to know about the female body and how is how the female body is supposed to react and actually reading and understanding what am I missing as a woman. And so it's so interesting how something that is supposed to stop a woman from being promiscuous is actually the very thing that's making me curious to want to learn more about my body um, and actually understand how my body is supposed to be. I think it's a very damaging practice when you as a girl even having a boyfriend, if your boyfriend even touches your, your leg a little bit, you know, you move away, you push them away because you know you have this deep secret that like you have nothing in the bit in the middle of your legs and so you're, you're shame, you don't want to share this, you don't want to tell them, you know, but a part of you is also like, why is it that I'm finding myself in this place where I'm I'm just not a normal gal or just not living the life that everybody else lives you know would anyone ever want to love me based on the fact that i'm dealing with this secret thing that seems like it can't be changed but yet i'm still struggling to try and accept it as my reality and so i really hope um and i pray that um this practice gets banned i pray that other people stop doing it because it has such a negative effect um, on you as a girl. It's shameful. It makes me feel less than a woman. I feel like I can't even begin to compare myself to other people. Um, I, I just feel like I'm, I'm missing out on something. I feel like this is not something I should be proud of. But I feel like it's something that basically causes me to have low self-esteem. I'm still navigating through these feelings. I don't know, honestly, if I'll ever overcome. I don't know if I'll ever accept that I can't change this, but how I wish and how I deeply regret that I had to go through this. I wish I had the choice to say no. I wish I had somebody there to advocate on behalf of me. I wish I had someone there that stepped in and actually stopped them from doing this practice to me. But unfortunately, I didn't and I have to live with this on my whole life. I think for me personally, education was one of the things that saved my life, I would say. The first time that I really recognised that FGM was so wrong was when I was in school because we were having a lesson on FGM and I remember walking out of the class and just kind of needing a break going to the toilet and recognizing that this had happened to me and that was also uh, around the period where I also recognized that what had happened to me when I was younger when I was being abused by a family member that 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 the term was sexual abuse I learned all about that in school you know and even though I had this sudden epiphany in the lessons, I still didn't speak up, you know, to my teachers. I still didn't tell anyone, but I just recognized within myself that there was language to what I had experienced. So education, I think for me, has been my saving grace.